Okay, last time I gave you a sketch of this idea that I uh, wanted to present to you of the institutional trap. That was, uh, it's not a very tricky idea, but I tried to suggest to you that these things at least do exist here and there, sometimes, on occasion. I was certainly not trying to make the case that uh, all the world is pervaded with institutional traps, but just by way of getting started, let me ask you to uh, search through your memory and uh, uh, help clarify what an institutional trap is. Please. Where decisions are forced. Okay, a situation within an institutional setting, uh, on the job, within a profession, working for a firm, where decisions are forced. Um, a little bit trickier question is this. What, uh, what's the point of calling attention to these in connection with professional ethics? What bearing on considerations of uh, what's right and wrong in professional in professional settings, might this idea of institutional traps have? Yeah? So you don't sit in judgment or blame people if you don't know what all the circumstances are that cause them to make a certain decision? That's in part it. I think, that, I think that's, that's good. I mean, I think that's part of my motivation. It's a very easy thing to uh, uh, criticize from the outside people who've made decisions which might very well have been forced. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, the kind of uh, situation that I have in mind is one in which uh, just about anybody at all who was trying as hard as they could to do the right thing might very well have made the same decision as the one that we're now perhaps uh, ready to criticize. Um, it, it's an open question in the case of any particular incident, any particular decision, uh, whether it was forced. I mean, I think uh, that would be a claim that would have to be justified. But I want to at least um, uh, call your attention to the possibility that such uh, things really do exist. Um, yet more complicated, I'm interested in whether any of you might have some reservations about this idea of an institutional trap. That's a bit tougher. I'm asking you to critique it. Are there any potential problems with this idea that decisions are forced? problems with its possible use. I don't mean necessarily uh, conceptual problems about what it means, but I uh, just am interested in your own. It, it's likely to come up in situations where uh, people have made decisions that are undesirable from some perspective of, of, or, or, uh, some perspective or another. And, uh, criticism is either forthcoming or has been made of their decisions, it might very well be that someone in their defense, or maybe they themselves, will argue that the decision was forced, that they were in an institutional trap. Well, it could be an easy way out. Yeah, it could be used as an excuse. So I want to call attention right up front to the fact that uh, um, while it may very well be that sometimes decisions are forced, that there really isn't much leeway for a person making <coughs> decisions in professional settings or else, elsewhere in life. This is not unique to professional life. While that can happen, uh, one has to, to uh, look at uh, the support that's offered for that claim. It shouldn't go without saying if someone makes the claim that the decision is forced, it plainly uh, isn't something that uh, need be accepted right on its face. Uh, it needs to be reviewed. But all I want to suggest is that sometimes they are. And uh, uh, wanted to get a little bit into a, a, a broader question, a wider question, just about responsibility that we have, not just in professional settings, but just the whole idea of human responsibility. Uh, let me offer you two propositions. Pull this back a little bit. Thank <laughs> you. 
if either one of these two claims, we are the products of our genes and our environment on the one hand, or we are creatures of our own making, if either one of these were offered as an exhaustive analysis of what we are and, and uh, how our <coughs> decisions in the end are, are, are to be accounted for, uh, they would be in conflict. Uh, I think the easiest thing for people to do is to say, well, it's a little bit of both. We're the products of our genes and our environment <coughs> to a certain extent. Uh, and yet we are creatures of our own making to some other extent. So I guess uh, the question I want to raise for you this time is not to choose between one or two, but to, to ask you about uh, which one you think dominates. To what extent are we creatures of our own making, and to what extent are we but the products of the uh, hereditary makeup that we start with, and then the, uh, the social influences that, uh, that act on us through our lives. How do these things uh, sort out? This is a philosophical question. So this isn't something you can look up. I'm asking for your judgment. Yeah? I, know, I think genes are a big part because uh, I know, I've read things that uh, twins have been separated and they come up to like things, have like the same mannerisms and uh, uh, certain views on certain things, but a lot of uh, characteristics uh, physically are the same too. And I think that's a large part of it. More than we, that, uh, so that actually you've only isolated the biology, the biological factor. Uh, what if I put together with that biological factor uh, the social factors, the, the things that in our environment that uh, uh, might shove us in one direction or another, uh, in our beliefs, in our, uh, in our training? Uh, putting that all together, uh, if, if you think genes play a huge role in making us what we are, I guess that would pretty much overwhelm anything in category number two. So we're kind of... Uh, resultants of a lot of different forces, some of them biological and some of them the environment. I haven't, you actually stressed the, the biological ones. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if you put that together, together with the environmental, it uh, makes a pretty strong case for what's called de determinism. Agreement? We're uh, nothing but uh, the products of our genes and our environment. Yeah? I think it's a decision that we make early on whether or not we choose to be products of our environment or whether or not we uh, basically are creatures of our own nature. Because if you look, Little example, louder, if you look for example at societies and um, how the degradation of some societies, how people are brought up and how some of them turn out as, as their environment would have them turn out and some of them turn out in exceptional ways and become exceptional people. I think it's I think it's more of a case where we make that decision whether we're going to be whether we're going to let ourselves become a product of our environment or whether or not we're going to make the decision and take action to become ourselves. So you're you're pointing to the fact that uh, you can find people take any environment you please, a uh, very much impoverished one, a very rich one, whatever. Take any environment you please, some people will uh, uh, be just what you expect. Other people will somehow break free of those environmental uh, uh, restraints, and uh, you are suggesting it's a matter of choice. So, uh, two, we're creatures of our own making. We choose what we are. In fact, we choose whether we are to be mostly influenced by our genes and our environment, or whether we will wind up shaping ourselves. This is itself a choice in your view. Discussion. We've got two proposals on the table. One suggests that uh, we are, I mean, I think in each of your cases, I'm not sure, I'm not, that neither of you wished to take the extreme case and say we, there is no extent to which, uh, well, in fact, in your case, you didn't wish to say we're not in any, to any extent at all, creatures of our own making. I'm not sure you you may have wanted to say that, but you didn't. Well, we are, but I just think that genes is the, the main 
That's the primary. All right, you just wanted to say that one was more, more influential than the other, by and large. And uh, you, uh, I, you, I don't want to put words in your mouth either. You don't, you're not saying that genes and environment aren't important. Uh, rather, that uh, two is a fundamental factor. Uh, I think you may have wanted, here, here's something that confuses me. I think you might have, may have wanted to say uh, it's a fundamental factor in the lives of some people, but not others. Some people really are, do become the products of their genes and their environment, and other people don't. But what, what's kind of confusing is that you say that depends on what choice they've made early on. Now, some people uh, choose to, uh, I mean, in your, in your view, some people choose not to merely be the product of their genes and the environment, and other people don't. What is it that makes the difference between those two? I think it's just a matter of setting yourself aside and, and saying, I don't want to become a product of my environment, and saying, looking around yourself and seeing what your environment is and realizing that that is not what you want and that you would rather not become part of that environment. So you make the choice to become your own person and basically start your own personal environment. Okay, but you, you pointed out that some people do that and some people don't. Right. What makes the difference between those two groups? I think it's just a matter of, of, of who they are and I think... Is it, for example, genes and environment that makes the difference between those two groups? It's possible. I mean, I think it's a, a combination of both that makes that decision. I think it's within the person and the type of person that they are, which does reflect their genes and their environment. Other discussion on this, uh, on this issue. Um, <clears throat> myself, I would not deny the importance of genes and environment. Uh, and yet, and, and, this, and, and that, yet this, is an, this is important in its impact on choices, finally. So, I mean, people do make choices uh, trivially. They choose vanilla over chocolate shakes. They choose to act this way rather than that. But um, the, uh, the, the case for determinism, and I'll, uh, this, this is a characteristic thesis of determinism. characteristic thesis supporting free will. Uh, the deterministic thesis would have it that uh, at least this is the, the genes and environment the most important factors. And it and, uh, may go so far as to say that all of our choices are finally determined. And if they said that, they would mean to include the particular choice that you're talking about. I mean, if there is a place in people's lives where they decide whether they are going to resist the forces of the environment, the strict determinists would say, well, maybe there is this difference among people, but that is itself a product of genes and deterministic factors. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, Well, as I say, for my own part, my, my, I'm, I'm inclined to uh, uh, I guess I'm inclined not to see that there is a necessary conflict between the idea of free will and the idea of determinism. A thing that uh, um, is difficult for me to determine is what, you know, in this discussion between free people who uh, advocate the freedom of the will suggests that we're creatures fundamentally of our own making. We make our own choices. They come from some source other than the strict constraints of genes and environment. The, the argument between those people and the people who are more deterministic uh, sometimes leaves me confused as to what is meant in this discussion by free will. Um, if, I, if I make a choice that is dependent upon my own judgment. I think very, very hard about whether to do this or that. Um, and uh, I wanted to make it freely. I mean, do I need to make it completely unconstrained from considerations that come out of my own experience? Uh, what would a fully free choice be? A fully unconstrained choice. Now, I, I would think 
that uh, what most people mean by free choice is one that's informed, one that uh, at least they've thought through. Uh, they may not be fully informed. People, people make lots of mistakes. But it's not this, for example. It's not making a choice based on the flip of a coin. I mean, that would be a random choice. I mean, I would have selected a randomizing device to make my choice for me if I flipped a coin. But uh, if I then do exactly what the coin tells me to do, I guess even there, I, I'm determined by whatever physical facts there are that made the coin come up tails rather than heads. For example, the force with which I flipped it, the air resistance, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these would be factors that would determine which side came up. And then in that case, too, I mean, even in that case, where I'm trying to make the freest choice possible, one's completely unconstrained by environment, by any other things, <coughs> uh, that one, too, would be not free, but determined, determined by physical law. So one loses touch with, uh, if, if you get too deep into this, you get kind of lost as to what freedom is supposed to come down to. My recommendation is that you back up. There's a perfectly common meaning to the idea of freedom. And it doesn't involve flipping coins as a free choice, unless you freely choose to flip the coin. But generally, it means you've you thought the matter through. You could have chosen either way. And you decide to go one way rather than the other. And without uh, trying to give a full-fledged philosophical justification for it, I'd say that at, the, at our level, the level that's important for us in considering professional situations and day-to-day and, and -day situations, um, it seems plain people do make these decisions. People do seem to have options. They're confronted with them. They, uh, they weigh uh, considerations supporting uh, both of the alternative choices, or all of the alternative choices, and they choose one. Sometimes they go back and forth. They're not sure which one they should choose, and they finally choose one. Um, however, I want to say this. I think more can be said about this. So I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting people do make choices. But last week, I argued sometimes the choices are constrained. Sometimes they're forced. I mean, I, when I, uh, when I when I walk up to the window at McDonald's, I'm trying to figure out you know, what, I, what, should I, what I should have this time. Let's say I eat there relatively <coughs> frequently. Uh, there's, you know, you know, there's, there's different things that can guide your decision. Sometimes you just keep getting the same damn thing all the time. Uh, there used to be a time when I was young when I could rattle off what I wanted in a fraction of a second, because it was the same thing all the time. Uh, the cheeseburgers, larger fries, and milk. I can't do it anymore, but I just go, <laughs> just get it out there, you know, because I knew what I wanted all the time. And then later on, variety struck me as being more interesting. So I would try the different things that they had. I would try the new things. But uh, you know, I, the choices were free. I don't feel that they were constrained in any particular way. And yet, I want to say that when somebody holds a gun to my head or to your head and they say, your money or your life, the choice is constrained. It's not you know, as if I can't possibly choose not to give up the money. It's, it's a forced decision in the, in the sense that's important to us. Now, what are the, the, the abstract or general characteristics that make decisions more forced? I mean, what is it about the situation at McDonald's that makes it seem freer than the one with the gun up against your head? More than two choices. Pardon? More than two choices. Well, well for example, I mean, one of the things the variety, I mean. That's right. There's uh, one, many options. Or at least two. And I think we have to say there's, there's at least two options in the case of the gun to your head. So let's uh, say many options that are real living <laughs> options. In the case of the gun to your head, that has a literal sense. But what I mean is sense, <clears throat> options that really people could take, that make sense. Make some kind of sense, considering that people are trying to, to do the best they can. They're trying to you know, live as well as they can, take these things <coughs> into consideration. People are trying to make the most reasonable decisions they can. And so one of the things that uh, characterizes situations in which choices seem to be free is that there's lots of different options. Anything else? 
Well, actually, you do have choice in that case. That's not, that's not the kind of case I'm thinking of. I'm trying to think of a case in which uh, uh, there may be lots of different options, but none of them are very serious. There's only one that really, I mean, give me your money, or that's what I have to do. It's, it's, it's you know, list lots of bad other options. Give me your money, or I'll break your legs, or, or shoot you in the head, or, um, Whatever. I mean, you just list lots and lots of bad things. There's, there's a lot of options there. There's a number of options, but they're not real and living options. What, what, what characterizes the situation? Well, it's the, that the situation uh, is relatively dire. Okay, I'll just, I'm just, I could probably formulate that a little bit better if I thought more about it, but it's, it's that. Uh, in circumstances that are, are tough, when uh, maybe all options, well, all options save one are extremely bad, or let's say all the options are bad, so you have to take the least of the two evils. I mean, that's what your money or your life is. Well, I don't want to give up my money. That's not a good option, giving up my money, but it's a better option than giving up my life. When those are the circumstances, that's the sort of thing. And I, I, I suspect that if you were to try and do a real rigorous analysis of this, you could find other factors. You could find subtleties in these factors. I just want to list a couple of them to show you what I'm, give you just a general idea of what I'm getting at. It's that there is, first of all, from last week, there is a difference between situations in which people make choices, real choices, uh, and in which the choices are forced. And uh, that's not, and you don't have to say just, I mean, having said that, you can go a little bit further. You can say there are ways of uh, thinking about the difference between making forced choices and uh, making real choices that are kind of abstract but can characterize the difference in, a, in, in an interesting way. So uh, what I'd say is that the, the more dire the circumstances, uh, and the, uh, and the fewer the real living options, then not only the more forced will the decision appear to be, it will be more forced. So uh, where people lack genuine options, or where there's a small number of living options, live options, options that we could expect a reasonable person to choose, when there's a small number of them, and the, and the costs, you know, and, and, and the and the, uh, and the circumstances are, are, are dire, and the costs of uh, making the decisions are high, uh, then we may very well see decisions that are forced, uh, where awful circumstances are coupled with small numbers of options. Those are the circumstances. Um, There's actually a little, even a little more that can be said. I mean, I think just sort of thinking about uh, uh, trying to put yourself in a position where you're just in a terrible uh, situation, you're starving to death, or you know, something like trying to figure out situations where you're in an awful place, uh, just thinking about human nature, thinking about actually the nature of all animals for that matter, you can expect that some action will be taken eventually. I mean, if the, if, if the animal's starving, they'll do something to try to alleviate this awful situation. People, too, in, 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 in terrible situations, will try to think of something to do to make their situation better. And if the options are few in number, then, they're, then, then indeed, the, <coughs> or if there's only one real live option, then the decision is kind of forced. Now, those are the sorts of situations I have in mind. Uh, pro professional settings, in particular, might look like that. And I think they do look like that frequently. Um, I, want to, I want to offer you as an example uh, one that I'm not entirely sure of, but I, I just want to portray the Challenger incident, you know, the incident where the um, where the, uh, where the space shuttle Challenger was wrecked. Why, why, was, why did that happen? Who knows what the problem was that led to the... Pardon? O-ring. O-ring. 
the part of the of the issue, part of the space shuttle Challenger <coughs> incident that I want to stress, though, has to do with the decision making that uh, that went into the decision to launch. Because lots of people were saying, "Don't launch, don't launch." The engineers, in particular, were saying, "Don't launch." But uh, the engineers um, were saying this. It, in, a, in a setting that made it difficult for the managers to comply. I mean, if, if, um, if the space shuttle program was on track, if the space shuttle program had been flying successfully, mission after mission after mission, and then on this particular mission, the engineers say, we don't think it's safe, it might have been very, very different. But the space shuttle launches had been delayed time after time after time after time. Uh, the newspapers were filled with uh, speculation about how NASA was no longer capable of, uh, of performing the kinds of missions that it performed during the 60s in the Apollo program. There's all kinds of suggestions that the NASA budget should be cut, that we should, we should stop uh, wasting our money on these sorts of things. Um, there was pressure from the, uh, from the administration that NASA prove itself. And again, this particular launch had been postponed several times. And every time it was postponed, the headlines and the, the reporting on the, on the, on the news media and, and, and the, on the electronic media and radio and television uh, was getting more and more cynical about NASA. Does anyone remember this? I'm not sure whether I'm, you know, because, yeah. And is that, is that correct? Do you remember like mine? And uh, there was a tremendous amount of pressure on the agency. And so the managers, the people who were try, having to decide whether to fly or not, they wanted good engineering device. And the engineers came to them and said, you know, we're concerned about the O-ring. There was a number of other things, by the way, they were concerned about. But that was, that was high on the list. We're concerned about the O-ring. And uh, the managers asked them this. They say, well, OK, uh, how risky is it? And the engineers responded, we think it's very, very risky. And then the managers said, uh, but it's flown every time. It's had the same old ring in the shaft. There's never been a problem before. Why all of a sudden is there a problem? And the engineers said, well, there's always been a problem. It's always been there. Uh, it's exacerbated in cold temperatures. But the fact is, this old ring isn't safe even under normal circumstances. But it certainly is, is irritated in these especially cold temperatures. But what you see is that there's a situation in which decisions were, having, were, were being made by people who were kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. They were caught between concern for safety, of the crew especially, concern for the, for the mission on the one hand, and concern for continuing the program on the other. In both cases, I mean, there was, the, there, there was certainly the human concern for the, for, the, uh, for the crew. But I mean, I think everybody knows, could, could, could at least imagine this this much that uh, if, if there was a disaster, it would be awful for the agency. It would be much, much worse than uh, yet another delay. So I mean, it's not like they were saying, OK, well, um, you know, we, don't, we, don't, uh, you know, we think that it's uh, human lives versus the welfare of the They, they were concerned on, on both sides with, with the future of the program, with, uh, with uh, the way, uh, with, with trying to behave as professionally as possible. And here was this awful dilemma between uh, deciding uh, you know, whether to launch or not. It had been safe, every, not been safe, but it had been successful each time before. Uh, in the end, they asked, can you give us better data than the data you've got? Can you show us that there is really a good chance that the thing will fail? But that's just not the sort of thing that's in the cards. The engineers can perform their analyses, and they could say, we're concerned about how well the material can hold up under these particular stresses. They can lay the information out on the table, and they can say, as they did, the engineers, in large numbers, not just one, but the engineers said, we don't think it should fly. The managers asked, can you really demonstrate to us that there's a risk? And they said, well, no, we can't do that. Can't prove it. Uh, they said, uh, well, you, you see, I mean, they said to the chief engineer, you see the pressures we're under. Uh, try, to, try to see this from the managerial perspective. And um, probably to his never-ending regret, uh, he said, uh, well, OK, I guess it should fly. 
Now, uh, a, one reason that I, we haven't mentioned yet for being concerned about the possibility of institutional traps is that we might actually set things up for decision makers. I mean, not we, but institutions may be set up in such a way so that this sort of thing is more likely. Um, uh, this is a very simplistic solution, but perhaps if, uh, if our concern for human life of, of crew members in manned space missions is to be paramount and is to be held as more important than all other considerations, perhaps this decision to fly in manned missions anyway should be taken out of the hands of people who may be under pressures for other reasons, like the, you know, to, continue, to, to uh, persuade the world that NASA is still competent. If not, uh, we're, we'll have to face the fact that that's going to be one of many competing sorts of considerations that professionals trying to make the right decisions will have to, will have to consider. If we want to say that life is a fixed point, that nothing should ever outlay a concern for life, then uh, we won't walk out the door here, right? Everything you do is risky. If we want to say something less than that, if we want to just say that risk to human life should take priority over certain other sort of considerations, then we'll list the ones that it should take priority over. That's fine. If that's to be a fixed point, maybe that also should be something we find a way of institutionalizing. Now, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not committed to the view that the, 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 the correct account of the Challenger mission involves institutional traps. I think what's apparent is that the pressure on people was tremendous to fly. If there were any way of alleviating the pressure on those important decisions, that would be a good thing. So that, and I think that perhaps that's something, something like that has been done with NASA. Um, but the upshot of the whole discussion that I, uh, of, uh, of institutional traps and the Project Challenger, uh, the, the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, tragedy uh, as, a, as a particular illustration, the whole upshot is that um, there may exist obligations, I mean, where there are these institutional traps, there may exist in some people an obligation to try and, and, and solve those institutional traps. It's, just, it's, a, it's a pressure point just like an O-ring. I mean, uh, if someone finds out that there's a, a, a defective O-ring, they should say, we should fix this. Because it's leading, it, it may very well lead to disaster. Well, similarly, if you find if you find that some decisions are being made under, under, under such pressure that they really aren't choices, but rather they're forced, then it's somebody's, perhaps, it's somebody's obligation to relieve the pressure, to try and fix that institutional setting. Now, I don't, they're not easy to fix, but the first step is calling attention to the existence of institutional traps. And I, I'd have to say that it's a professional responsibility. I mean, if, even if sometimes professional decision makers can't really be blamed for making particular decisions because they're forced, I mean, conceding that sometimes that's the case doesn't relieve them of all responsibility. It may just be that precisely in those occasion, uh, occasions, there is a responsibility or an obligation of the of professional to call someone's attention to the fact that this institutional trap exists. You see what I'm saying? While, on the, while the institutional trap may uh, make it hard to make free choices, fully uh, independent choices in a professional setting, while that might be true, uh, that doesn't and, and while we might not want to blame the professional for making certain, for making those choices that are forced, the prof it may be the professional's responsibility because they're the ones who are in the trap. They're the, they're the ones who spring these traps, who find them. It may be a professional responsibility to call attention to the fact that, uh, uh, that the pressures get so great on that job that it's not, it's not really a living option to make any other choice but the ones that get made. I'm not sure whether that's clear or not. <coughs> I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Not entirely. 
No? Yes? Oh, okay. Good. All right, comments? Questions? Yeah? If they knew, like, doing with the institutional trap, if they knew what the decisions were, I mean, one being that there could be a delay yet one more time, mm -hmm. or they could fix the problem with the, uh, okay. the O-ring. Okay. Wouldn't it have been like the totally safer and smarter decision to wait the next day? I mean, that, well, the, case was, the O rings were, I mean, required major surgery. I mean, they had to redesign these things. Yes, but it would have been smarter and safer. And yeah. instead of putting someone else's lives in the hands of a few people that call themselves NASA to try and further the, the space exploration, it still would have been a lot safer and a lot less costly if they would have just fixed that. Instead of watching no, every, every, I think everyone agrees, you know, in retrospect. I mean, now that that happened, you look back and you can say, oh, God, it would have been so much better, cheaper, uh, so much better for the agency. I mean, the, in the end, trying to make the decision that was, for the, I mean, this is why this is a bad decision in part. Trying to make the decision that was in the best interests of NASA, all things considered, led to a decision that was absolutely disastrous for NASA. But uh, what are you suggesting? You're suggesting that you, you, two things at once. You're saying they should have fixed the O-ring, but they're also saying they should have not put this decision in the hands of NASA. It, it should, well, it, it was NASA's business that was launching it anyway. But it should have been made a lot. It should have taken a little bit more time. I know it was. It was like on. You had to do it either way at that time. That it was either well, launching. Yeah, either launching or not. Either launching or not launching, but. If they should have thought about it. I mean, they, should, they shouldn't have said, no way, it's not going up if it's that dangerous. Because if the O-ring, if they knew that, what could happen, if they even had a the slightest thought about what could happen. No, but they need to know not just what could happen, what's the likelihood of this happening? They didn't know, though. Well, they, the engineers were saying, well, it's, it's, it's higher than we like. The, the likelihood of it's happening is, is just too great for us to be happy with launch tomorrow. And then they, as they said, but then it's gone up every time before. The missions flew, and this record of successful flights uh, built up at least a, a psychological support for the for the design. I mean, it. it was, but they flew. <coughs> They've flown. I mean, people, yeah. We used to think that these were. As a matter of fact, there was. Uh, again, this is my understanding through third-party analysis of people who have sort of documented the case and gone in and talked to these folks. Uh, but there was a, a growing sense of confidence just because of the series of successes. And of course, they had delayed this mission. There were things that delayed missions. In fact, this mission, this particular mission, had been delayed a number of times. And the missions before it had been delayed a number of times. And at that particular moment, the media was making fun of NASA. I mean, stand-up comics were making fun of NASA and its ability to get these things launched. I mean. Uh, this was the pressure. I mean, this is a lot of pressure. And what was being impugned was NASA's competence. And of course, NASA blew it. I mean, NASA then, a decision was made that uh, seriously <laughs> undermined, I mean, uh, to say the least, seriously undermined confidence in NASA. It still hasn't recovered. It's still working to recover uh, from that decision. Uh, but I think I, what I, what the, my question about which was that you were recommending, you said fix the, I mean, cut, plainly, fix the O-ring, that would be a good thing. But that was, that was costly. It really would mean a long delay. It, wasn't, it, was a, it was a design problem. It wasn't just going off and picking one off the shelf and putting it on. I mean, it was a design problem um, that needed resolution. And uh, there, was, there would be no telling how long, if they decided that uh, that, that O-ring, that this design for an O-ring just wouldn't work, there's no real predicting how long it would be before the, Challenger would launch. There was also this. There was the teacher on that flight. I mean, they had this whole thing set up where there's this teacher on the flight and school kids all around the country in school after school. Were any of you in that? I mean, I don't know what the, the, uh, how this works, but you know, like the school kids all around the country set up to watch this mission. They're just sitting there watching. I mean, this is another major traumatic event, but I mean, they were sitting there watching this thing. And they'd set it up. I mean, they could cancel it. Of course, the decision not to cancel was absolute 
disaster. It was disaster to people's psyches. It hurt to watch it. I have trouble watching it to this day. Uh, the, the films. I mean, it's been played so often. They, in the first two days after that thing, they played over and over and over again. I still I couldn't watch it. But that's me. I'm very squeamish about stuff like that. But uh, the pressure, the pressure that was on this decision was monumental. From the press, from people, from all those school kids out there, from the president, or the president, the executive branch. Anyway, I don't know whether. I don't want to say it was the president in particular, but the executive branch, which really is responsible for NASA, uh, had put the pressure on. And they just said, well, but it's flown all these other times. Why not? I mean, why are you, why are you saying this now? They said, well, because of the temperature. And they'd say, all right, uh, what's, the, what's the evidence that suggests that there's something that's going to happen here? And that just wasn't the way evidence worked then, and it usually isn't the way that evidence works. I mean, you can't have evidence about literally untested events. They can just say, given what we know, given what tests we have performed, our prediction would be that uh, this is chancy. Can you guarantee that it's not going to work? No. That's just not the way these things work. So what I'm suggesting, and again, I don't know, I mean, I, most writers in the field, most analysts actually do attribute blame to persons here and there in this decision-making process. And I don't wish to say that they're wrong. What I want to emphasize, though, is that this, this, is, the, this is the sort of real-life circumstance that uh, uh, comes close, anyway, to exemplifying what I mean by an institutional trap. The, the solution to the problem, I mean, let's say we find somebody who's, this, there's another problem, too. We find somebody who we think is to blame, and yet really, they just made the best decision they could under the circumstances. But we say, no, they're to blame. And so we remove them, say, OK, now we fix the problem, right? We fix the problem. We've taken away, taken the, the blameworthy person out of that setting. Let's hire somebody to replace him. Well, if you're just putting a new person into a situation where anybody doing the best they can would make the same decision, you've not fixed anything. You've not fixed the thing. It's just like taking one of those defective O-rings, taking it off a space shuttle, and putting another one of exactly the same design right back down on it. Institutional settings are just like any other situations. They can be defective. They can make it impossible for people to make free choices. And what I'm suggesting to you now is that whereas the professional's responsibility may be somewhat mitigated, at least, by the fact that they're in something like an institutional trap, their responsibility for their decision, that is, there may never, nevertheless be this other responsibility that they have to call attention to the fact. If, the, if it comes to their notice, if it comes to your notice or my notice, that there's these situations where I was trying the best I could to make the right decision, and yet I could the, the, the constraints on me, the pressures, the, the, the options were so bad and so limited that uh, there really wasn't anything else I could do but make this decision. If that, if that becomes... If, you, if, if, if it comes to your attention that those sorts of situations exist, then I think it's a responsibility to call attention. So it's sort of a second order, higher order ethical responsibility, even in cases that are characterized in the way that I've tried to describe institutional traps. See what I'm saying? OK. Questions or comments? All right.